Okay, class, what we've all been waiting for here, lecture number 26, this is our last lecture. We still have some tidying up to do here. We've got to have to take care of a, a final examination, third examination, you know, so we still have some room uh, to play with there. All right, last time we were together, we were talking about Reconstruction, this terrible period of time, particularly for the South, anyway. I mentioned to you about the Freedmen's Bureau. That was under the direction of Oliver O. Howard, general officer, fought for the North anyway, it was Provide for freed slaves, missionary assistance, food, education, and so forth. All right, we also talked about the radical reconstruction that's going to take place here. Went through the various types of Republicans that we had, and uh, you can look back through your notes for that. All right, and some of these radical Republicans, by the way, Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, we've talked about earlier with Canaan and Sumner. Uh, some of the Reconstruction plans, 10% plan, that was Mr. Lincoln's plan. We also talked about the Wade Davis bill. All right, and we went through this uh, lengthy, lengthy discussion here of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. If you'd been my, in my class face-to-face, -face, we would have spent the entire 75 minutes talking about that. But many, many visuals present for you with that. Anyway, it was a terrible period of time. I hope you get the chance to visit Theater. All right, we talked about a number of other things here. John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth was part of that conspiracy, and it was a conspiracy to take the life of the President, Vice President, and the Secretary of State. After the unfortunate death of Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson became the President of the United States. And uh, we also went through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution, and you need to recognize that here, folks. All right, now, I will tell you right now that the uh, radical Republicans were very much against, very much opposed to uh, Andrew Johnson. He was a Southerner, and he was a slave owner here, so they had, uh, just by nature, they're going to be against him. And so the radical Republicans passed a couple of laws, and this was a radical Republican that did this. And I want to share those with you, so let's go over to our camera here, and let's see here if I can get these positioned right for you good folks here. And I'll move my hand away anyway. All right, and these were it was known as the Tenure of Office Act. And under the Tenure of Office Act, this would uh, uh, prohibit the President of the United States from firing or dismissing any person in a public office, including members of his own cabinet. Well, by nature, you know, the President can appoint or deappoint, you know, his cabinet members with that. And uh, the other part of this, and, and by the way, that Tenure of Office Act was designed to protect the uh, Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton. And the other one of these was the Command of the Army Act, which would prohibit the President from issuing general orders in relationship to the Army. It had to go through the Commander of the Army itself. So you can see what the Radical Republicans are trying to do. They're trying to strip the President of his power. And sure enough, we're going to find that Andrew Johnson will defy the Tenure of Office Act, and he intentionally fires the Secretary of War, Edward M. Stanton. And, of course, uh, this brought about impeachment hearings against Andrew Johnson. And, in fact, I'll show you this. I'm going to go back to myself here for just a second here. And this is an article that came out. Uh, this was during the, the impeachment time of uh, uh, William Jefferson Clinton. And it tells you here that Johnson trial echoes 130 years later. You can see Andrew Johnson, who is uh, uh, right in front of him, as a matter of fact, here. So let's take a look at our uh, results here. And, of course, you know, the impeachment takes place in the House of Representatives. That's not where the trial actually takes place here. And in the House of Representatives, the impeachment was 126 to 47. All it requires to get an impeachment is just a majority here. So they easily got that. But the way our Constitution is designed here, folks, to convict, get a conviction and remove a president from office, it requires a two-thirds vote. And the number here, the vote here, was 35 to 19. It's one vote short. So Andrew Johnson was not... He was impeached, but he was not removed from office. We have had since that time two other impeachments. Both of those impeachments, just like Andrew Johnson's impeachment, you know, was a witch trial that never should have taken place. That of William Jefferson Clinton and also Donald Trump here. And I'm telling you right now, and you mark my words, from the future, we have set a precedence in our country here in the future. Any president that is not a same member of the same party as the House of Representatives will be impeached. You wait and see here. Impeachment has lost its credibility. All right, so back we go here, folks, and we'll move on here. So Andrew Johnson, there was certainly no way that he would consider, you know, trying to uh, uh, run for election here. So he is out of the picture, and now we're going to move into our uh, next presidential election. I'm going to cover a couple of these very quickly here, folks. And this uh, next presidential election is 1868.
U.S. Grant. Uh, he's a Republican, but he probably could have gotten a nomination as a Democrat, too. He's one of the most popular people in the country, and certainly in the North here. And if we look at this uh, election results here in the 1868 presidential election, U.S. Grant received 214 electoral votes to Horace, uh, to Horatio Seymour, I'm getting a lecture ahead, an election ahead, and who had 80 electoral votes. He was from Illinois, by the way. And with the popular vote, it was 53% to 47%. And that was the election results here. You know, and I'll tell you right now, U.S. Grant, as much as I like him as a military person, a military commander, he was pretty much inept as a president. It's one of the worst administrations that we have had. Uh, his uh, cabinet openly engaged in the spoil system. I, I think Grant was just over his head with this. Now, the spoil system under the U.S. Grant at that time is sometimes referred to as Grantism. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. We'll move on into our presidential election of 1872. U.S. Grant gets the uh, presidential nomination, the Republican nomination. Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley was a newspaper editor out of New York. Go West, young man, go West. A popular quote associated with him. And for Grant, Grant gets 286 electoral votes. Horace Greeley, 66. And you see the uh, popular vote was uh, even more in favor for Grant this time, 56%, 44% here. So U.S. Grant is elected as president here. Okay, so uh, let me share some things with you here. And we'll go back to this. Here's a likeness, a presidential likeness here of U.S. Grant, Sam Grant. Hey, anyway, kind of interesting individual here, and I like him very much here, not so much as the president. Another likeness here of Grant, that looks like the same one, Grant with his children. Uh, this photograph was taken just shortly before his death. Uh, Grant died of laryngeal cancer uh, after the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, his uh, congratulator sent him a box of cigars and developed a... Uh, tobacco habit, and it will eventually take his life here, folks. So anyway, that was U.S. Grant. Well, I had it on my mind here. Sorry to have to reach away like that. Uh, Grant's tomb, Grant's tomb, which is located in New York, and if you get an opportunity, you may want to go visit there. Anyway, so that is U.S. Grant. So let's go back to my camera right here and see what else we have as we continue on. It was during Grant's second term in office that the uh, first of several scandals appeared, and I'm not going to go into these in great depth here, folks, we were in class, we'll do it a little bit deeper than this, but one of the scandals involved the Union Pacific Railroad, and, uh, and it, a French company was uh, helping to construct the Union Pacific Railroad line, part of the Transcontinental Railroad, and this scandal was known as the Crédit Mobile, you probably would pronounce it Credit Mobile, we won't pronounce it that way, Crédit Mobile, but it involved the uh, company here actually passing on stock and giving stock to uh, senators and congressmen and even members of Grant's own cabinet. I don't think Grant was involved in that. There was another scandal that involved Grant's uh, staff, personal staff. It was called the Whiskey Ring. Another one involved the Indian Ring and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Another involved the Navy Ring. So it was just a scandalous administration. All right, so often people at that time referred to it as the era of good stealing, the era of good stealing. I think you've heard something similar to that before, the era of good feeling under James Monroe. All right, shall we move right along here, folks? And by 1873, the country is going to enter into a depression. It was the worst depression our country had ever experienced up until that time. It was called the Panic of 1873, and as you well know, the person that gets the blame for this is the current administration, and particularly that of the president states here. And for Grant and the Republicans, they felt like that the principal cause of this was the number of greenbacks that were still in circulation. In fact, there were $356 million worth of greenbacks still in circulation. So as a result of that, let's get this position properly here, as a result of that in 1870, uh, 1870 Five, Congress passed and the President signed the Specie Resumption Act, which recalled greenbacks. It gave them four years to get the greenbacks turned back in here. All right, those would be redeemed here. Species Resumption Act is what it is known as. On the other hand, we're going to see a new political party form, which is called the Greenback Party. And next semester, we will address one of the elections that the Greenback Party was present in. Now, we also had some more positive notes here under the Johnson and Grant administration, in which the United 
United States. This is under Johnson administration. We actually purchased, and I wrote here, uh, we purchased Alaska. Did I write it out? I did not write it out, so you'll have to write that in yourself, you folks. We purchased Alaska in 1867 for $7.2 million. We got it from Russia. And I tell you, good folks, today, if you're traveling up into Alaska today, you still see a lot of the old buildings that date back to that time where Alaska was under Russian control. Uh, this was done through the efforts of the Secretary of State, William H. Seward, and many people felt like this was just a just a just a stupid way to spend money. What are you going to do with Alaska? You know, it's just a tundra, just a, a wasteland there. And as it turned out, you know, when we had the Klondike Gold uh, Rush, it would pay for itself many, many times over. Seward's Follies, what it was sometimes referred to as Seward's Icebox, uh, I think it was a magnificent acquisition. Wouldn't have been great, you know, if we'd had, remember back to the time when the 54 4 you fight, you know, if we'd been able, under James K. Polk, we'd been able to link, you know, uh, continental United States uh, all the way up to the Russia itself. That would have been a real choice for us. Okay, now we're going to see some other things to take place here and by uh, uh, 1870s anyway, the North, the Radical Republicans, has largely lost interest in that of Reconstruction. So you're going to see that the Old South begins to return here. And by 1872, we're going to see some uh, white supremacist organizations to form here. One of which is known as the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, we have another one which is known as uh, Whites of the, Night, uh, the Knights of the White Camellia. These were covert groups. They would disguise their identity. Uh, but we also had some of the overt groups that did not do this. The Red Shirts out of South Carolina. The White Leagues out of Louisiana who were overt. They made, made no efforts to try to uh, uh, disguise their identities here. And would often, shall we say, police elections to go into the election, the polling sites there, and maybe with a weapon such as a pistol or something that uh, up to the side of the head of the voter would convince you to uh, to vote Republican or in this case to vote Democrat. It was a technique which was called bulldozing. And just a quick mention here of the Ku Klux Klan. We don't hear much about the Klan anymore, and I uh, thank goodness. And they were quite active, and you'll see this next semester here. They're active and around uh, uh, 1915 to 1925. Uh, they returned a little bit in the 1950s, 1960s, and then we just don't hear much about the Klan anymore, thank goodness. But the Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1866 by Nathan Bedford Force, a Confederate general, John Gordon, a Confederate general, too. John Gordon is from Georgia. And uh, here's the, uh, I like this here, the original Ku Klux Klan building. That's in Pulaski. Tennessee, by the way, you see the plaque here that's on the front, which uh, city officials have turned that plaque around. It's reversed, so you cannot read the plaque today, uh, because this is considered to be a, a, a racially sensitive place there. That's in Pulaski, Tennessee. I'm not recommending that you actually go there. Now, do you think you would ever find a military base, military installation, installation named after Nathan Bedford Force? I doubt it. I don't think you would. I wonder if we'd have one about a co-founder here, John Gordon. In fact, the answer to that, quite frankly, is yes. We have Fort Gordon, Georgia, which is located in Augusta. I spent quite a bit of military time there during my active service and later as an Army Reservist for that. And recently we've had some talk, you know, to uh, change the name to some of these military installations. I hope they don't do that, and I don't think that we will do that. All right, so anyway, that was it. So white supremacy begins to return here, folks. And in many cases, what we're going to see here is the establishment of black codes, Jim Crow laws, black codes, Jim Crow laws, refuse to rent land to uh, blacks, refuse to give credit to blacks, refuse to serve blacks in restaurants, you know, uh, refuse to employ blacks. And we just go on and on and on with that, too. Uh, for blacks, they could not testify in court against white people. Uh, the blacks could be arrested for vagrancy and hired out to pay out your fines. Uh, these are just known as black codes or Jim Crow laws. Okay, so let's move on here, folks, and see where we are here as we continue with this. And we're doing very, very well here. Uh oh missed that one anyway. And uh, hang on for a second here. And let me see where we are here. Okay, so we're going to move on here. And in the congressional elections of 1874, the Democrats contained, con gained control of the House of Representatives. This was the first time that they had done so in, in a long period of time here, folks. 
the first time since 1861, as a matter of fact. Here. By 1876, in the South anyway, only South Carolina, Louisiana, Florida were Republican. All the other Southern states were Democrat. And the reason these states are still Republican is because they have a military presence there, or they had had a military presence. So let's move into our presidential election here of 1876. And presidential election 1876 and for the Republicans they will run Rutherford B. Hayes as their presidential uh, nominee and for the Democrats they will run as their candidate 61 years old uh, Samuel J. Tilden and uh, Tilden who was from New York by the way I don't know if I wrote that out here and uh, Rutherford B. Hayes had fought in the Civil War he was a northern general he's from Ohio by the way and when the election results came in Samuel J. Tilden had 51 percent electoral vote and had 51 percent popular vote Rutherford B. Hayes had 48 percent of popular vote Tilden had 184 electoral votes and Rutherford B. Hayes had 165 electoral votes so who wins this presidential election in 1876 and your eyes are not deceiving you here folks Samuel J. Tilden won that presidential election of 1876 so what happened what happened with that and as it turned out they were 20 contested electoral votes. And these votes came, 19 of these votes came from Louisiana, South Carolina, Florida, and we had one from Oregon, one contested electoral vote here. It looked like there had been some bulldozing, or maybe duplicate ballot sets of ballots have been turned in. And if you notice here uh, in the state of Florida, Florida still trying to get their act together when it comes to casting electoral votes and just voting in general here. Okay, and you know what I'm talking about for that. So what are we, what are we going to do here? And so what they decided to do, let's, we're, we're going to make this fair now. We have to make this fair. We can't have this be one-sided with this and because we had the presidency at hand. So what they decided to do was to create a special committee. And in this special committee, we would have seven members of the House of Representatives, excuse me, five members of the House of Representatives and five members from the Senate. And we would have five minutes from the Supreme Court, five members from the Supreme Court. How can that be any fairer? In fact, it looks like it's perfectly legitimate to me. And then what they did, of those 15 members, seven of those members were Republicans, and seven were Democrats, and one independent. This was a Supreme Court justice here that was independent. And I asked myself, and I'll ask you, does anybody see anything wrong with this? It looks completely legitimate to me. But then what turned out here was this individual, the independent here, left his position as a Supreme Court member, and he was replaced by Republican. So when he was replaced by a public Republican, this meant that there were eight Republicans and there were seven Democrats. Now let's go back and look at my numbers up here. For Rutherford B. Hayes, or let me just ask you this, for Samuel J. Tilden to win this election, how many electoral votes does he have to have of those 20? And for Samuel J. Tilden, all he needs is one. Only need one electoral vote out of the 20. But how many does Rutherford B. Hayes need? And Rutherford B. Hayes needs all 20 of those contested electoral ballots. And guess what happens here, folks? When it all shook out, we had all 20 contested electoral ballots to go to Rutherford B. Hayes, and he ended up 185 and 184 for Samuel J. Tilden. Anybody smell something? Well, I smell something for that, too. And as it turns out, what this is referred to as, this is a compromise of 1877. And it was a deal. It was a deal. It was an underhanded deal. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes agreed it would be a one-term president. All the military personnel that were occupying the remaining southern states there would be withdrawn. This would allow the, all the southern states to go Democrat that. Rutherford B. Hayes was referred to as his fraudulency, and as you probably suspect, his administration was just not very effective with that. All right, so let's continue on a little bit here, folks. We're going to see a new South to emerge. This is going to be a completely different South than the South that we had during the Civil War prior to the Civil War. We're going to see more industry to take place in the South. More textiles will emerge with that. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, American Tobacco Company, particularly out of North Carolina. New industry will appear here, which is uh, iron and steel, iron and steel. And a magic city will miracle itself into existence in the 1870s. And I think you know where I'm talking about. It's located about 40 miles from where, where, where I am anyway, in Jasper, Alabama, and that is Birmingham, Alabama. 
and for education for former slaves. Institutions will be established, particularly one that was established by Booker T. Washington, and this institution is known as Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute. Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, Booker T. Washington. And in fact, I think I have a likeness here, Booker T. Washington, right here. He's a great American here, folks. And if you go to Tuskegee University today, you'll find his burial site there on the campus. All right. And anyway, and that's kind of interesting with that. We likewise see some other institutions here. Fisk University, which is out of Nashville. Morehouse College, which is out of Atlanta, Georgia, here. And some very prominent African Americans have been educated at those institutions. But on the other hand, we're going to see as we move through the years here in approaching 1900, segregation returns. And segregation will return in railroads. And I'm talking about like in railroad cars, railroad lobbies, railroad restrooms, hotels, theaters, restaurants in general, schools, restrooms, where we will go through a period of time where we will have it's literally whites only, colored only. Uh, so, anyway, segregation returns. Uh, it didn't help matters at that time in 1896 that a Supreme Court decision, Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, established the precedence of separate but equal. In other words, we could have all white schools if we had equal all black schools. You could have uh, uh, all white lunch encounters if you had lunch encounters that were segregated, likewise, you know, for, for African American or minorities here. And in voting, what we're going to see here, again, we got voter suppression here. Uh, voters were required to pay a poll tax. Well, good gracious here, my friends, today or in our 2016 presidential election, we only had 50% of the fellow Americans to cast their votes. What if you had to pay a poll tax? What if you had to pay a tax to vote? I think the voting turnout would be far less than 56% with that. And also during that period of time, you had to pass a literacy test or to be able to prove your understanding of the United States Constitution. Tell me, please, quick, what is the 14th, and 15th, and 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution? If you can't answer that right now, you're not going to be able to vote with that. All righty, so anyway, those are just some of the things that we don't have today, but during those times in 1900, you did have the poll tax, and you did have to pass a literacy test and be able to prove that you could read and write. And as you will suspect here, this certainly would eliminate a number in the population that would be denied the right. Okay, here, folks, that's it for today. It looks like this took about 23 minutes to go through this, so we'll cut it a little bit short today. I do have to uh, prepare a review for you folks for your third examination. Okay, thank you.